the power of the Holy Spirit. What's amazing about the person of the Holy Spirit is that he's part of the Trinity. You say, well, Pastor, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. You're correct. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, neither is the word Bible in the Bible. But the Trinity is revealed in Scripture, and the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, is the very one who would be our power to understand the Word of God. And for the book of Romans, it is in a very, very deep book, a very, very powerful book, and we need the Holy Spirit's strength and power and insights to unpack one of God's greatest treaties written to man. And the emphasis is on the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, stop trying to reform yourself, my friend. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. You can't change yourself. We've all tried, it doesn't work. But listen, when you surrender and give up to the transforming power of the Spirit of God, that's when He goes to work in you. As believers, we can live in freedom from the condemnation through Jesus Christ. That condemnation is the fact that you and I know that we're sinners, we've sinned against others, and we've sinned most importantly against God, and how do we live? Well, all of a sudden, when Christ comes into our life, the guilt, the shame is removed, and we have the Spirit of God at work within us. Let's grab our Bibles and let's look at our message titled, The Power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that it's the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. And according to the Bible, the Holy Spirit lives inside of every believer. And you can, by the way, you can detect that when you're talking to somebody else by their worldview. What do they believe? Who do they say Jesus Christ is, for example? Did you know you can know this? Talk to people. We need to stop being so superficial as a culture. You know that, everyone? We live, we live right on the edge, and I'm not talking about thrills. We live right on the edge of reality. <laughs> We need to start digging in. Now's the time to start digging into people's lives. People are scared. People are uh, not sure what's going to happen. We need to ask people, hey, do you know Jesus? They're going to say yes. Then you counter and you say, can you define, Jesus who? Which one? What are you talking about? Let them unpack that. And it might open up a door of evangelism. You can tell them about the real Jesus. The one who is revealed in the Old Testament. And all of what he did is recorded in the new. The remarkable ministry. We also know this, friends, and it's quite powerful. The scriptures tell us that in Joel, the book of Joel, the Hebrew prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass that afterward that I will pour out my spirit. Notice this. God the Holy Spirit. On all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, this message is given by Joel 2,500 years ago to the Jewish people. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show signs or wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Listen up, everybody. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Friends, that is Joel's description of the second coming of Christ. That's Joel's description of the consummation of man's rule on earth. When this was mentioned 2,000 years ago, and we'll read it in a moment by the apostle Peter, Peter, speaking to the Jewish people, cites the book of Joel saying, this work that you're seeing is by the hand of God. Joel talked about it. But as you well know, the religious leaders of Israel, they rejected. But that's okay. God put them on pause. He's going to start play any moment. Maybe he's doing that now in the world around us. God's getting ready to work with the Jewish people again. But note this. What he's saying right here. If you are a student of the Bible, you're saying, wow, that's end time stuff. Yes, it is. But watch this. He says in verse 31, the, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome or terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Watch. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be a deliverance as the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. The end time events. Now, church family, 
Mark this down in your notes. Acts chapter 2, verse 14, 2,000 years ago, after the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ back to heaven, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and take heed of my words. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remarkable announcement. God does not live on stone tablets. God does not live in a temple. Think of it. You say, Jack, wait a minute. As a Jew, I'm offended by that. Wait, wait, wait. No, you're not. No, you're not. Just listen. Who wanted to build God the temple, everybody? David. But what did God say to David? David, you're, you know, your hands are too bloody. In fact, read the fine print. David, your hands are too bloody. You're a man of war. Um, I just want you to know I don't need a house. You can't put me in a house. And David wants to build God a house. David is told by God, okay, listen, you can't build it, but you can fund it. You can pay for a lot of it. In fact, he did. King David funded most of it. But he couldn't build it, but his son Solomon did build it. On the day that the temple was complete, those of you who know your Old Testament, what happened on that day? The priest lined up to go in to get the things going, right? To go back or to take what's on the tabernacle and put it into the temple with all of its glory. Before they could even go in the building, the Bible says that the Spirit of God moved inside the building. The Shekinah glory appeared within the temple and emanated out from the temple so that the priests could not even make their way in to the temple. Is that awesome? Friends, listen, right now today, the very throne of your heart, God has decreed in the word of God, Old and New Testament, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, I will live in your heart. I will dwell within you. That's not a New Testament invention. It's a New Testament recording of an Old Testament promise. God doesn't dwell in temples made with stone. Thank God. He wants to live inside your heart. And the question today is, is exactly, is that the truth regarding your life? Does he live within you? Does your heart beat with the things of heaven? It matters. Secondly, look, there's the great appeal. There's the appeal of heaven. Heaven's appeal is reality within us. Heaven's appeal. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting. Mark down these two words, please, along your margins or in your notes. The word groan, we've come across it before in this book of Romans. Stanazo in Greek, it means to exhibit pain or to show evidence of pain. We groan. Every single one of us know this in life to one degree or another. Physical pain, emotional pain, non-physical pain. That is, I would think, the realm of the spirit. Think about that. The pain that this world is going through. But check this out. It means out of sorts or disjointed, misaligned or skewed. Pain. We groan. The world is groaning. Just the evidence of the fact that the world is groaning tells you that there's something better. A remarkable truth. And then the word eagerly. The word eagerly here means to experience expectation. Friends, listen, when you're in pain, the greatest thing that you can hear is when somebody tells you that you're going to get relief or we're going to... Have you ever been in real pain? Have you ever, gave, have you ever given birth to kidney stones? <laughs> listen, don't do it. I, a couple of years ago, I didn't tell you about it, but I just, I was feeling fine, and then I started sweating, and I'm wondering, why am I sweating? And within five minutes, I went from being what somewhat resembled a man, <laughs> I was vomiting on my face, in pain. When I showed up, I mean, I didn't, couldn't even drive. Somebody drove me to the hospital, and when I showed up, the, the, the guys, get a wheelchair! Somebody recognized this guy's given birth to a stone here. And I'm telling you, I went in there and, and I, oh. But the cool thing was during the whole thing, I kept thinking, Jesus, this is nothing compared to what you went through. This is nothing compared to what you went through. This is nothing compared to what you went through. And then they came and they gave me morphine. 
And I understood right then and there, now I see why there's drug addicts in the world. <laughs> Relief came when the nurse said, you know what, you're really, this is a whopper. And that's not comforting when they say, this is, <laughs> this thing is seven by seven. Yeah, I have it. It's framed at home. I named it. It's called Little Jack. I got it on the... I have it. I've got it. I, I dated it, gave it a name. When somebody says, we'll be right back, I'm going to go get a nurse, and she's going to bring you some relief. It's like, yes. In life, betrayal, hurt, relational issues, people coming against us, people hating us, misunderstanding. How, many, how much pain do we go through in life when somebody hates us or whatever and they say why they hate us, but that's not even the reason. They misunderstood. They don't even know. That's some of the worst. And you have no way of responding. Deep pain. And yet Christ is there and he mitigates and he comforts and he gives us his word. But I can't wait. Listen, friends, just like you, the older I get, I can't wait to see heaven. Heaven, this is not it. The appeal of heaven is beautiful. It's encouraging. But we groan and we eagerly wait with expectation. The Bible says in Galatians 5, verse 5, for we through the Holy Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. What a statement that is. What does that mean? That means me as a Christian, watch, me as a Christian, Walking with Jesus, I'm keenly aware of all of my faults and all of my sins. Now, my sins are not so much. In fact, I don't know if I sin outwardly much anymore at all, if anything. Depends on how fast I drove here today. <laughs> but outside of that, you know, I'm not going around cheating or drinking or murdering kittens or looking at porn. I don't do that. But on the inside, I have thoughts. Or I want that... Uh, oh, and this is, this is not right, but it's like, oh man, look at that, that's an awesome cake. Who, how many people, and you, you look at the size of the cake, do you do this or is it just me? And it's like, that's a standard cake. And I'm looking around at how many people are in the room. Do the math, the, the geometry from that angle, and you come to the conclusion, I need to get up there. That's called selfishness. That's called self-centeredness. And, and we sin. Listen, as you walk with Jesus, you become much more keenly aware of your imperfections. And you know this is true. It's like looking at those magnifying lamps in a hotel. You go to a hotel to relax and enjoy yourself, and then some nut puts this magnifying glass in the bathroom, so you turn it on, and you can see every pore, everything, and you go, what is that? They should have a different lamp that makes you look better than what you really look like. You're paying for that room. It should make you look great. Nope. When you see yourself more clearly, you're much more aware of your deficiency. However, if you stay there, you'll be depressed. If you step over into the arms of Christ, who's telling you, I love you. I have called you with an everlasting love. Come to me and I'll forgive you. I'm your Lord and Savior. And the beauty of it all, how does he do this? He takes ashes and converts them into beauty. When just about rock bottom, he says to you, you're the sinner and I'm the Savior. You're lost, but I find. Come to me. And you go to him. Personally. Don't come to this church and say, I want Christ. We can, we can introduce you to him, but a church cannot give you Christ by saying, well, okay, just sign right here. <laughs> Listen, did we pass the plate around this morning to have you give the money? No, no, we did not. When you, is there a little card in the seat in front of you saying how to become a member? No, it's not there. You want to know why? Because those things get in the way of you meeting God. Look at it. See this jacket? I don't wear jackets, but last week I wore a jacket. People said, I like the jacket. I, I like the jacket. The jacket, I, it, I, I, it's better with the jacket. So I'm thinking, I don't like the jacket. But because I love you, I'm wearing the jacket. The price I pay. 
Would I rather have the jacket off? Yes. But for you, because I love you, I wore the jacket. Okay, listen. We become all things to all men that some might be saved. Right? And when we introduce people to the Savior who washes away sins, irregardless of your background, irregardless of your pedigree or the lack thereof, I love when you speak about pedigree. The Bible says not many wise God has called, not many astute or not many wealthy and not many royal or not many blue bloods is the word that we would use God has called. This is not many. When Queen Elizabeth died, did you know that she was the one who said, when she came across that portion of scripture, she said, I'm so grateful that it says that not many blue bloods, that Christ doesn't call not many. She says, I was saved by an M. Because it doesn't say he doesn't call any blue bloods. It says many. Isn't that beautiful? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single human has sinned. He, he invites everyone to come. But do all come? No. But some do. And the Queen of England did. And I love the fact that she, she says, I was saved by now. Now, I don't know if she did that. Like, <laughs> an M. Now, I don't know what I'm communicating right now, by the way, in the gang language. I have no idea what this means, so forgive me. But she says, I was saved by an M. There, an M said many, not any. And you might say today, I've sinned so far, Pastor, God would never have me. Don't talk like that. You're insulting the blood of Christ. The Bible says you sin big and you're forgiven, you love big. What an awesome thing. You can't run. I mean, you can run. But you're not going to get anywhere. His love will be there. You'll run. You're running from God. You're running. I'm not, not going to have. There's no way. And while you're looking back to see how far you are away from him, you'll run right into him. <laughs> David said, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I flee to the uttermost parts of the sea, you're there. He's awesome. Heaven's a reality, and we appeal to that reality. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. I love this. Our citizenship is in where? Heaven. Church family, listen up. Our citizenship is in heaven. The word in the Greek is politic. The way that we think, the way that we act, what we do, how we conduct ourselves is in heaven. So what does that mean? It means what heaven is we are to represent here and now. Hang on to your seats. We're not encouraged in the Bible to go out and propagate our opinions on people. We are to propagate the will of God, the word of God to people that they might have hope, that they might have salvation. That they, are you hearing me? Now, I know that sounds nuts in an age like this, which is all about social media. You can get caught up into the opinions of people. You need to get caught up in the opinion of one. And his opinion is very clear. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. It is truth. And he's awesome that way. He's precious that way. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Listen to this. So Christ, our Messiah, was offered once to bear the sins of many. I'm going to interrupt myself right here. If you're a Jewish today, for example... You ought to write down right here, Isaiah chapter 53. You ought to write it right there. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. You know where you find that language? Isaiah chapter 53. Old Testament prophet to the nation of Israel that the Messiah would give his life for the sins of not only the nation, but for the world. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. You can't appear a second time unless you came the first time. He came 2,000 years ago. Apart from sin, meaning sin will not be a factor when he comes the second time. Hallelujah. When he comes back, it says, apart from sin for salvation. Tremendous statement. Jesus Christ is coming back for those who are his. And when he takes us, either by life, right, uh, or by rapture, it doesn't matter. When he picks us up, it has nothing to do with sin. The sin question, that means it's been done with. Think about this, everybody. 
He's picking us up unto salvation, not unto the sin issue. Where were and when was our sin dealt with? On the cross 2,000 years ago. He was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, says the Bible. It's thrilling. Well, that's exactly right. We are talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. I've got to tell you that the power of the Holy Spirit is the literal answer to the weakness, the frailty, what is it? The apathetic nature of what is called the church today in the world. Listen, when we read the book of Acts as an example, we see a church that experiences the power of the Holy Spirit and transforms the world that is around it. And do you think 2,000 years later that God is tired? Is that what's wrong with your church, my church, our lives, wherever? Is God tired? God cannot get tired. He never grows weary. And that's why you and I need the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is eternal truth and it's true today. How does that happen? God's power. How does that happen? By the Holy Spirit. God wants to live inside of you. Friends, listen. You know how you move into a house? Or you move into a building? Well, will you allow God, the Holy Spirit, to move into you? You move into that building and you hang your pictures on the wall, you set it up, you decorate it, and you make it your own. God does the same thing to you and I if we'll just let him. Invite him into your life today. Let him live in you. You were built to have God live inside of you. You know how you're empty, lonely, maybe you're searching for meaning to life and you just don't get it, you're never satisfied. You know why you're not? You'll never be satisfied, friend, until God moves inside. Please believe me when I tell you that God's word is so true and so powerful that when he moves in, Jesus starts rearranging furniture, that he starts rearranging thoughts. He starts rearranging priorities. He moves in and he starts taking over our lives. Hope that doesn't scare you. He takes over our lives in such a way that he starts leading you through this life. Friends, I'm telling you, this is the gospel truth. This is God at work. This is the power of the Holy Spirit doing what he does. Listen, if you want to know more, go to jackgibbs.com. You can connect with us there. God bless you until next time. You are watching Real Life with Jack Hibbs. One of the greatest gifts God has given us is a gift that we can give to others. But giving this gift is harder than it sounds. It's the gift of forgiveness. In a world filled with hurt and resentment, choosing forgiveness isn't easy. The weight of past grievances and the lure of bitterness weigh us down and keep us from moving toward reconciliation. In The Gift of Forgiveness, Dr. Charles Stanley shows us how to extend forgiveness when grudges run deep and restoration seems out of reach. Life is filled with personal conflicts and confrontations. Will you choose to forgive? The Gift of Forgiveness will equip you to break free from the chains of bitterness. Don't miss your chance to experience the liberating power of forgiveness with this life-transforming book. Receive a copy when you make a gift of any size to the Ministry of Real Life at jackhibbs.com or by calling 877-777-2346. Order now. Life is full of fear, doubt, and worry. The more you listen to and see the world today, the easier it is to feel hopeless and helpless. Amidst the confusion, a voice of hope has emerged. The Real Life Network. Founded by Jack Hibbs, the Real Life Network is a free digital media platform, void of the noise of secular media that attack people of faith. Click on the QR code or sign up for free at reallifenetwork.com. Fast forward your faith. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effect. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? 
we ask that you commit to support Real Life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.